Thank you for your talk today on the six syllables mantra. Your analogy of the waves coming home to the water helped me understand more deeply the concept of calming our minds. Also, thank you for varying the content of your talk. Uh, thank you for the compliment. Um, um, the, the speaker is also learning at the same time as listeners. Um, speaking and, and, and those who are speaking and those who are listening, they learn at the same time because the energy bounds. Um, as long as there's a will, there's a way. There's a will that the listeners want to, to know more. The listeners want enlightenment. There's a will in there. And if the speakers have the same will, this will interact. And the best results will come out. So it's, just not, just, it's not just the talker uh, who makes sure that the congregation is, is smooth and successful. It's also the, the responsibility of the listeners who have feedback, who have enthusiasm, and who is willing to, who has a will for enlightenment. If you are a slothful uh, 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 listeners, or desultory listeners, and you don't care what you're listening, you just sit there doing nothing, then it's void. Uh, there's no interaction. There's no energy that flows through. So it's very important that the listeners have to attend have to listen attentively and make the contributions, and the speakers have to pull out what he has to say to you. And uh, varying the content of the talk, uh, yes, because I sometimes Siddhigabha Sutra, it's quite straightforward. It's just it's quite similar to a storytelling of the past lives of, um, for example, Siddhigabha Bodhisattva and Bodhisattvas, and uh, unless you have unless you are practicing the Siddhigabha uh, method of enlightenment, the Siddhigabha Sutra may not be of interest to you. You may just treat it like a fairy tale if, if you don't have the insight into it. Um, so that's the reason why in uh, Siddhigabha Sutra, um, I've already come up to chapter 3 in uh, two or three weeks. Uh, I just read on and on, and when it comes to terms that I have to explain, then I explain the terms. I go relatively fast in Siddhigapa Sutra. Varying the content of the talk, I think is important. Um, I think the speaker has to, has to interact to the listeners. It's just like in singing. In any kind of concert, you have to feel the interaction of the, of the listeners. Um, in order to have the concert successful, um, it's the same thing. Uh, the interaction in the Chinese language is gan ying dao jiao. Gan ying, the dao is, is the way. There's a way of transmission. The transmission must be two ways. So we have to vary the content of the talk. And today, most of the time we spent, we, we spent half an hour on just Om Mani Padme Hum. And you think Om Mani Padme Hum is simple and in meaning, it's extremely profound in meaning. It covers the Sutra, the Sastra, and the Vinaya. It covers all the literature of, of Buddhist teaching, if you go deep into it. Um, it also covers, in, in a summary form, form uh, the method of a, an approach to enlightenment, Padme. Padme is all the method. Padme in the Chinese language is the three great elements in everything. That's the essence, the form, and the function, functionality of it. Uh, Padme conveys the three. Of course, it conveys as not as much as, 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 as matni. Matni conveys the essence of it, the reality of it, the inner core of it, patni. That's the Buddha nature. That's 
that's uh, symbolically part. Money conveys this symbolically Buddha nature in you. Part me is the function, functionality and the merits. Uh, the method is part me. Part me is purification, pacification, understanding the mind. You, through meditation, through chanting, through um, repentance, through chanting of sutras, chanting of the Buddha's name, through all the good deeds that you have done, through your behavior, through speech, you're carrying out part me. Part me is in every aspect of life. What you've done, what you're doing, what you have spoken, what you're about to speak. It's so comprehensive that nothing is not part me. Nothing, no method is not matni. So that's why we have to, con to vary the content of the talk. The second question now. How to deal with someone who hurts you all the time? Who is lying all the time, who is criticizing you all the time, who is disrespecting you all the time? Um, I don't know in what relationship you're talking about. Because we can answer this question in broad general terms. And can, we can also answer these questions in specific concrete terms. And let's try the specific concrete terms first. When you are saying that someone is hurting you all the time, lying and criticizing you and uh, not respecting you, um, that is passively though. He's not hitting you. He's not hurting you physically. He's just lying and criticizing and not respecting you. That's easier to deal with than hitting you, hurting you, or attempting to kill you. That's, that's better than, than that. But let's, let's talk about this specifically. If you are if you're in a family, your brothers and sisters or your mom and dad, any one of the family members is lying to you, criticizing you, and not respecting you. Um, if we apply the six parameters to it, the first one is generosity. The second one is morality. The third one is tolerance. The fourth one is diligence. The fifth one is concentration, the fifth is wisdom. So you have to apply wisdom to it. It does not matter what he says, it does not matter what, how, how he lies, how he criticizes you, how he disrespects you. You just tolerate it. Because after all, it does not matter, does it? If he's always yelling at you with bad words, in the Chinese language we call it we borrowed the deaf ears of Mr. Chen, who is deaf. You just don't listen to it. When it gets from one ear and it flows out from the other, it does not really get into your mind. That's the most important. Remember that matni in you, oh matni part me home, that matni in you has the God nature. That's God in you. And don't turn that God into a devil. You can turn that God in you the nature of God in you, into the devil. When do you turn into the devil? You have that equanimity, peacefulness in your mind. And now your brother, your, 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 your father, your mom, or any family members comes up to, to lie to you, criticize you, disrespect you, disrespect you. You don't turn your God nature in you into the devil by interacting with vehemence, with hatred, with, with um, hostility. You just accept it peacefully. Because a word does not hurt you. And also, you can think about repaying his debt. Because after all, what is a relationship? What is, what is really a relationship? Why is a relationship created? In a fam as a family member, or even in a dating? You, you, you're dating with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, or, or in, a, in, a, in a marriage. What 
um, what are the causes that occur that matures that relationship? There must be causes. Nothing comes without any cause. And don't just look at the cause of the present life. There are causes of previous lives. Why do we all come together? Because we have unfinished business before. And if we go to extremes, what are this unfinished business? Debt. You have to repay your debt. Emotion. You have to repay your emotion. One is spiritual and the other is material. You owed him or her a lot in the previous life. You've got to repay it in this life. You can't get away with it. You think you, you can get away with a loan that you haven't paid? Don't incur any liability. You can't get away with any loan. So don't easily accept any favor if it's not necessary. You've got to repay it. As I always said, which I like to reiterate, always give. People give to you, oh, you give me everything, I save up all my savings and I use up yours, it's good. No, it's good to give out. So, as I said, in any relationship, say in a husband and wife relationship, if you owe him debt, you've got to repay it. And when the debt is repaid, a divorce will arise because it's been paid up. If it's a repayment of, um, of emotions and passions of previous life, or, for example, you own him or her your love, with that love, quote unquote, conditional love, because there's a difference between compassion and love. Love is without condition, and this love is one side, it's conditional. Conditional upon the fact that you love her. It's both sides. Love is selfish. Compassion is unselfish. So, if there's unfinished business, if, this, if, this, if that is an unpaid emotion of love that you have to repay, you loved him with all your heart. But he betrayed you. He committed infidelity. He had a third party. Or, if you repay the debt, or repay the emotion, he just died out on you. He just passed. He's not living anymore. You repay the debt already, and he's gone. He's come back to get your payment, to get your emotions. So it's all unfinished relationship. We call it the karma. There's an unfinished karma that you have to finish up. So I, am I off the topic? I've got to pull myself back to the right track. But the question is how to deal with someone who hurts you all the time. Yes, I'm on, I, I know, I'm, I'm on the right track. Okay, now. So, tolerance. You tolerate it. Being able to tolerate is a hero, and being unable to tolerate is a coward. It's easy just to express what you think. In North America, what we always believe, human rights, I, ex I have to express whatever I feel. Why do I have to tolerate you? It depends on what. If it is for the merits of the majority of the populace, if it, is, it, if it is to benefit all sentient beings, you stand up for it. You cannot tolerate. Because they're killing all, the, all these other sentient beings. You don't want to tolerate until the sentient beings are all killed. You tolerate using the wisdom to tolerate. So maybe if, 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 if you um, express objection against a government policy, and people say, hey, the Buddha teach you to tolerate. Stand back. Don't come up to this front line in, in, your, in your picketing. You've got to tolerate. Remember the Buddha said tolerate, so go away. You've got to tolerate. Otherwise, you're not a Buddhist uh, following the Buddhist religion. It's not. We can only tolerate on what you imposed on me, but I cannot tolerate if you, if you hurt and impose all sentient beings. 
I may even be able to compassionately sacrifice my body for the sick and for the merits of all sentient beings, so I won't tolerate. So you've got to use wisdom, prajna. So in this relationship, if somebody lied to you, criticized you, not respecting you, you tolerate it, and you feel like a hero after you've tolerated it. Because usually I could not, now I can. After listening to the Buddhist lecture, to, to, to the Buddhist teaching, I can tolerate more. And after toleration, I don't tolerate with, with um, uh, heartless of feelings. I, don't, I tolerate with willingness. I tolerate with compassion. I tolerate with happiness. With, with no conditions that I tolerate. That's the real toleration. So you can tolerate. And if you're used to toleration, you're on your path to enlightenment. If you can tolerate the hardest, um, the most serious slandering, you can tolerate any cursing. People curse you for no reason, criticize you for no reason. You just accept it. And thinking that, well, this is your, maybe I should, I should tolerate it so that I can bounce back to you the right energy. How do you bounce back to the people who hurt you with the right energy? You don't bounce back with hatred. You criticize me, I hate you. You're bouncing back with the devilish energy, hatred. But if you bounce back with love, with compassion, with tolerance, you affect the person who's hurting you. He can feel it. After you tolerate it for 10 cases, 20 cases, many instances of toleration, he'll feel ashamed of himself. Oh, Janet is able to tolerate me for a year. I'm cursing him, I'm mistreating him, and he can tolerate it. What makes him so powerful? What makes her so powerful? I used to be like a hero, I can, I can suppress other people, but now I feel like a coward. I, I feel like a tyrant. I don't feel happy hurting other people. You are actually indirectly educating the tolerator. That's how you affect people, not, not, by, um, not by yelling back, cursing back. So toleration, just that one parameter is enough for us to go into the life of enlightenment, to, to go into the path of enlightenment, toleration, tolerance. Endurances. What are we doing when we're meditating? Well, when we're meditating, because of the construction going on, you heard a lot of hammering and sawing, and some people, different people have different attitudes to sound. It's to some people, oh, it's terrible. I'm coming for meditation. These guys, they're sawing and they're making all this hammering. I don't like it. I dislike them. They're stupid doing that to me. There's one attitude to it. The other attitude is, well, what can we do? Well, maybe next time I don't come. The third attitude is, good, I can tolerate it. It's just like I'm a mountain meditating there and all these clouds come. I just let the clouds drift by. I can tolerate it. It doesn't pollute my mind because my mind is free from it. I'm detached from the emotional feeling of that disturbance. I don't feel disturbed at all. And after that fact, there are a few people who, who interact differently. One person who was so disgusted about this sound come up to the superintendent and said, look, I'm coming for, for meditation. Can you just shut up for one hour? Another go to the superintendent and said, oh, how, did you, how are you doing? Are you speeding up your construction? That's great. Two kinds of attitude produce two different kinds of results. Which one do you prefer? It's your mind that sets the forerunner of the action. Which mind? You want to turn your god, goddess mind into a devilish mind? Or you want to turn your devilish mind into a god mind? It's up to you. So that's enough for this question. 
Third question, how to keep concentration during meditation? How do I know I'm meditating in the right way? What will I feel or how to do it? And that's a very good question. The other two questions are good, but this is a very good question. When a very good question comes up, I'm tempted to answer it. So maybe I'll just use what I said today about samatha and vipassana. Remember in meditate, in constant, in concentration deals with one part of the meditation. Say meditation, if we can split meditation into two parts, in common English, meditation in two parts, one is called concentration, the other is called insight or contemplation. In the Sanskrit language, the concentration is called samatha. In the insight meditation, it's called vipassana. And which one do you do first? Usually we do samatha first. But Samatha is no different from Vipassana. You cannot, it's not a, a stage by stage meditation. It's a conglomeration. One cannot do without the other. But you can say where the emphasis, where is the emphasis that you want to put? Samatha, zi, Vipassana, Guan. Samatha, according to uh, uh, Tian Tai sect, or according to Yu Che Si Di Lun, Yogacara Guru built me Sastra, and, uh, and, and other, and other uh, sutras. Samatha has nine methods, nine methods in it. The first one is, in the Chinese language, is uh, Lei Zhu. Lei Zhu is mental placement. Lei Zhu, the first, I'm talking about concentration, just. Maybe I should just cover concentration. For Vipassana, insightful meditation, we'll cover some other time. But just for the sake of, because I don't have that much time. I can't speak all the time in here because we finish our meal and we're not, we need to finish it up. Uh, I don't want to be tempted to. to, to postpone it for too long. But just finish very quickly on the nine stages of, of training the mind, Jiu Xin Zhu. The first one is Nei Zhu. Nei Zhu is mental placement. What is men mental placement? Mental placement is to place your mind on an object of attention. That's Nei Zhu. To place your mind uh, it's called Lei Zhu is mental placement, is to place your mind on an object of attention. An object of attention in the Chinese language is Suo Yuan Jing. What is your object of, in this case, what we're using, what is our object of attention? Do you know our object of attention? You don't even have an object of attention? You, you should speak out five years ago. Do you have an object of attention? We've been, we've been saying the nose tip, right? We're breathing in and breathing out in the nose tip. And I always said, assuming we're a sesame seed in the nose tip, we're breathing in and we're breathing out, we are that object, in and out, in and out object. You have that object as the center of attention. And our mind is like a monkey mind. If, if you're so forgetful about that object that the ob you forget about it, you just put it back. You've got to have an object. Another object is what? That's not the only object. How many objects do you have in meditation? How many objects? The sky would say. <laughs> How many objects? The sky would say it. A flame is an object. A picture of, an, of a Buddha is an object. My nose tip is an object. My eyebrow is my object. You are my object. The sound is an object too. Amitofo, Amitofo. The sound is the object. Some people use Amitofo as an object. When he breathes in, 
army. When he breathes out tofu, that army tofu, army tofu, constantly is an object. You can meditate on that too. What would you use as objects of attention in your daily life? What would your eyes use as an object? Matter, whatever you can see, sight. Your eyes see what? Your eyes, your sensory organ of eye uses sight as the object of attention. And what do your ears use as an object, object of attention? Sound. You curse me, you slander me, you yell at me, your ears use sound. What would your nose use as an object of, of, of attention? Frequent smell. Oh, this smells good. This smells awful. I hate it. This is you just smell. Oh, I like this perfume. Uh, this lady goes by, he looks ugly, but he smells good. He's applying the, the, the most expensive perfume. I like the perfume. So your, 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 your nose, what's the, what's the object of the tension of your nose? That's the frequency. What is the object of attention of the tongue? The food, the taste. That's the object. What is the object of attention of your body? All things you can touch. This is soft, this is hot, your body. So in other words, all your sensory organs interact with all these objects. And all these objects are only broad categories. All these things, you interact with them. What problem would arise if all these five senses interact with all these things? What problems will arise? Do you know about this? Greediness, hatred, jealousy, you name them. Depression, disappointment, sadness, fear, yelling back, cursing, killing, lying, sexual misconduct. Oh, you, you name it. These sensory organs interact. They're being led away by all these things. Oh, here's a beautiful lady. Jeez, good, nice body. And what do you think of? What do you think of? Here's a, a handsome guy. Uh, here's this guy with a with Ferrari. Oh, how I wish I can have that Ferrari. This guy is terrible. I hate him. But he's my colleague. He's going to climb ahead of me in the ladder of management. And I hate him. I want to put him down. I want to stab at his back. I want to get him out of the company. I want revenge. I want to climb up to be the CEO of this company within five years. I don't care. By all means. At the expense of hurting all the other guys. I don't care. As long as I'm successful, that's what counts. So all these sensory organs attached to this variety of objects and they create what? To name just three poisons to categorize all those. They, attach, they, they create what? Attachment, hostility, and ignorance. And because of these, you create karma. If you create good karma, it does not mean that you always create bad devilish karma. Karma. You sometimes create good karma. You help people. You're compassionate. You you uh, you're releasing sea lives. You are helping people. You're going out as a voluntary worker in a nursing home. You're helping sick children. Sometimes you're doing good deeds too, creating good karma. But most of the time, we're creating bad karma. In a meditation, you're canceling all these other objects of attention and streamline it to just one. You train your mind to streamline that attention to just one. Not sound anymore, not say anymore, not fragrance anymore, not touch anymore. Just to that one single one pointedness, that object of attention. Because you're wiping out all these other objects of attention which lead you astray, which lead you to suffering. You are creating that object of attention which helps you to what? to tame your wandering mind. After all, what creates all these bad things for you? Is it God who created it for you? Your mom created this for you? Your husband created this for you? Your, 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 your sisters created it for you? No, it's you yourself. And who are you blaming? You're blaming your body for it? It's that thing inside of you 
that consciousness inside of you, that mind that creates all this for you. Are you not going to tame it, to understand it, to know more about it? Or you don't care, you just be led away by all these objects of attention and go in to do your bad karma. And then you get into the cycle of suffering life after life, years after years. And you don't even know about it. You just interact by emotions. When sadness comes, you cry. When hostility comes, you repulse. You resist, you fight, you throw things. Or, at an extreme, you kill yourself. That what's, that's what happened in extreme depression. Or you kill others. That's what we call homicide. Well, I don't have enough time. I've just finished one. So, <laughs> not enough time to do all the eight others. So, uh, let's stop at this point. And the, remember the nine stages to train your mind in Samatha. And if you are successful in doing Samatha, you are at the stage of neighboring on the first dhyana.